just heard from one of the most famous of Jesus' sermons. And as so often with Jesus' most famous sayings, I am the bread of life, they're also one of the most puzzling of all the things that Jesus says. Not to worry, the church gives us five weeks in a row to meditate on this one puzzling phrase. Well, we've gotten started already. This is our third week studying this passage. Two weeks ago, Dean Stout spoke to us about the sacramental significance of what Jesus is saying. Each Sunday, we gather and celebrate the sacrament of communion, and it's a reminder that Jesus isn't simply someone back there in the past, but also mysteriously present with us in the meal that we share. Last week, he spoke again, but this time he talked about how the whole Christian life is, in a way, caught up into this mystery. It isn't just the bread that is taken, blessed, broken, and given away. Our whole lives follow that fourfold pattern. Well, that sacramental significance is certainly one aspect of what Jesus is talking about when he says, I am the bread of life. But what I'd like to do for this Sunday and the following two Sundays is something slightly different. We understand the spiritual sense of bread because we're familiar with the ordinary sense of bread. And what I want to do is reflect on three things in ordinary life that illuminate the spiritual life. We might call them three things, three things that are equipment for living. St. Paul calls them faith, hope, and love. I know we don't ordinarily do sermon series here, but I don't think it would hurt for us to reflect on these very central components of the Christian life. So, faith. We'll talk about that one today. Hope and love. You won't find a lot of people who are against these things. Despite being associated with religion, which doesn't have the best reputation, people feel good about hope and love. But faith, people aren't quite so sure about that word, oftentimes for good reasons. Take it on faith. We probably wouldn't have to think too hard to think of examples of people using faith in a way that's manipulative or controlling. Even for those of us who do think the life of faith is for us, people perhaps who gather at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning or tune in from a live stream, we may have a sense that faith sounds good, but we're not sure that we've got it. It feels a little bit far off, maybe something we once had or have on our best days, but we're not sure it's there all the time. So what I'd suggest is that when we talk about faith, we might use a word that's a little more ordinary, something that's closer to home. The word I'd suggest is trust. Trust. That doesn't conjure up quite the same images of stained glass and pews, but I think it gets to the heart of what we mean when we say faith. And trust, most of us recognize, is what makes life possible. An example that's sometimes used, slightly humorous, is how do you know your parents are who they say they are? Well, you might come at me with your birth record or your hospital record or talk about your aunts and uncles and how they attest that they really are the people who they say they are. But in the end, it all boils down to trust. We have to trust someone even if it's the hospital or the census data. Trust is what makes our ordinary life possible. And most of us recognize, after we've grown up a little bit, that trust is also what makes life worth living. If we don't have people we can trust, if we can't depend on one another, then life starts to lose the sense that it had. We take risks when we trust, of course. We sometimes say that we're going to take a chance on someone. And that implies a sense that there's vulnerability, that there's risk involved in trust. Well, most of us know that we need that 
trust, that arena in which we feel we can rely on one another in order to take that risk. But we're also a little bit wary of risking too much, of being vulnerable when we're not sure it'll be returned. And so we sometimes come up with rather ingenious ways of sidestepping that risk. A few weeks ago, a uh, tech startup came out with a new product. I like to keep an eye on these sorts of things. You get a sense for what's going on. And this new product is a device you wear around your neck, and it listens in on your conversations, and it sends you text messages to check in on you. Now, it's modeled as a kind of AI companion, but rather tongue-in-cheek, it calls itself simply friend. Well, I was encouraged to see that the reaction to this was almost universally negative. Most of us still seem to have a sense that friendship involves real relationship, real risk, real mutuality. You can dream up a friend in a lab, but just like Dr. Frankenstein found in Mary Shelley's novel in the 19th century, the results may not be exactly as advertised. We need risk. We need that sense of mutual sharing in an adventure of trust. And this, I think, is where ordinary life, normal life, normal relationships show us a picture of what it means to relate to God. Most of us who have been in this for any amount of time know that relating to God isn't like an inanimate thing. It's not an air miles points where we know what we're going to get out when we get into this thing and just count up and rack up the points. We know it's more like a relationship. It involves trust. It involves risk. Well, you risk something when you pray. When you ask God for something you really want, even if you know you're not going to get it. You risk something when you come and sing in public. You risk something when you trust your life to God. So why make the risk? Why do this thing that's rather unfashionable? Why risk trusting God? I imagine there are lots of stories that you have, lots of reasons you have for why you've made that risk, why you trust God. Maybe it's not something you feel all the time, but I imagine there are many witnesses in this room who could share stories of why they trust God. That's one thing we might work on as a community, is simply learning to share those stories of trust. That's one way our own sense of trust in God can grow, is from listening to other people. But what I want to listen to this morning is what St. John has to say. As someone memorably summarized it, God so loved the world, he didn't form a committee or write a mission statement. No, the word became flesh. God dwelt among us in the person of Christ. And so, as we hear in today's gospel, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. God takes the risk himself. God risks everything to come to relate to us. And that, St. John says, is why you should trust God. There's certainly risk involved. There's no question that Jesus preaches a message of risk and loss and sacrifice. But the reason to trust God, according to St. John, is simply that God has taken the risk already. God has risked being in relationship with us. I sometimes talk to people who are anxious about saying the creed, as we do every Sunday. They're not sure they can get through the whole thing without perhaps crossing their fingers at one line or another. And I talk to some other people who simply feel that it's rather far off from everyday experience. What does this have to do with 21st century Toronto? Those are fair points. And I wouldn't want to brush them aside. But what I try to say is simply that the creed isn't here to say, sign here or you're out. 
creed says, this is what God is like, so you can trust God. This is who God is. Trust God. Of course, it probably goes without saying that that's easier said than done. Most of us know that trust isn't the kind of thing that you want one day and shows up on your doorstep like an Amazon Prime package the next day. It takes time. It takes prayer. It takes a life of living in to that trust. Well, one of the things that encourages me is something that shows up all the time in the lives of the saints. Again and again, they say that trust isn't something you work at as a kind of exercise. It's not simply something you gin up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps so that you're somewhere between heaven and earth, full of faith. No, trust has this extraordinary way of showing up when you don't expect it. It's a gift. It's grace, even. I know I've talked before about a personal hero of faith of my own, Eddie Hillisum. For those of you who haven't heard, she was a 20th century Jew who uh, died in a concentration camp, but lived uh, during the worst of the Nazi persecution in Amsterdam. And she didn't really have any religious background or upbringing. She wasn't particularly interested in God. And yet over the course of those last years, even as Nazi persecution got worse, she suddenly found herself drawn toward God. She couldn't really account for it. She has this wonderful diary where she records what she's thinking. And then slowly those thoughts start to turn into prayers. She talks about a compulsion she feels to kneel, this sense, almost an embodied sense that she needs to pray. She finds that trust is growing all the time in her. Well, Eddie Hillison's life, it was, if it was just the one time, we might write it off as an exception. But I really do think this is the whole pattern of how trust in God works. It shows up in unexpected places. Not when we necessarily feel we need it, but when God wills to give it to us. So, the first of these three equipments for living faith or trust. It's the basis of the relationship with God. It's a risky endeavor, but maybe most of all, it's a gift from God to us, drawing us into a place of trust. Next week, I'll speak about that second gift, hope, and then finally, in the third week, we'll turn to what St. Paul calls the greatest of all God's gifts, the gift of love. And so, to the giver of all good gifts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be praised, might, dominion, and splendor.